Well, good morning, and President Wilcox, thank you for those very kind words. I hope you all realize what a blessing it is to have uh, Reed Wilcox here with you at your helm. And uh, there are many other dear friends here today that uh, I think this school is really blessed to have such, such wonderful administrators and faculty. Uh, I would like to uh, say that uh, I've only been on campus since about 5.30 last night. I went up and walked around the fields up there, saw the tennis team playing, saw the soccer teams practicing, and uh, I felt some of that sweet experience that uh, I'm gonna mention in a minute. And then I got to go and hear uh, Jesse Jolly and Jessica Eaton and their uh, colleagues do some amazing things at the recital last night, and it was just f fabulous. And then again this morning, we got to uh, hear the choir, and that was another treat. It's just been one treat after another. Uh, anyway, you, you young people are certainly coming of age at a an uh, interesting time in the world, I'll say that. Uh, we've got mass kidnappings, mass murders, uh, civil wars, invasions of so sovereign nations, record typhoons, earthquakes, droughts, economies on the brink, the family, the traditional family, which is the st structure that holds civilization together, uh, is uh, under uh, siege and so forth. But you also, uh, in spite of these challenges, have some amazing opportunities. President Monson said, the sweetest experience in mortality is to know that Heavenly Father has worked through us and the world is in need of your help, close quote. I, I just hope that you can imprint that on your minds, that it's a sweet experience to help and it's a wonderful opportunity you have in this world. The inspired mission of SVU is to mentor students to become leader servants. And this mission goes hand in hand with President Monson's call for you to help the world. President Sal spoke of some of the qualities and characteristics to become a leader servant. And among the traits he mentioned is, and I quote, they must be able to think critically, analyze complex information from a variety of perspectives, and draw from a broad foundation of knowledge. Furthermore, as they make decisions, we must act on sound principles, end quote. I hope you all realize what a uh, wise and inspired man Dr. Sowell is. From his list of qualities of a leader servant, I would like to focus my remarks today on one little segment, clear thinking. I believe that more than ever, the world needs leader servants who can think clearly. As been, been mentioned, most of my uh, career over the last 40 years has involved cleaning up messes associated with financial crises. Every situation is complex and every situation is different, but I'm confident that each of these three crises I'm gonna mention, which I was involved in quite closely, was caused by a lack of clear thinking, not by just one individual, by, but by a large number of very smart and very decent people. Uh, the savings and loan crisis in the early 1980s was caused essentially by an entire industry, and there were about 6,000 savings and loans. Maybe some of you don't even remember what a savings and loan is. It's a bank that makes loans primarily to uh, finance housing. Maybe you saw the uh, movie, It's a Wonderful Life, but uh, savings and loans were created to make loans for homeowners to buy homes, basically. Anyway, they, they would normally make a, a loan for 30 years, fixed rate, meaning the interest rate on that loan isn't gonna change. And the money that they would lend out would come from their depositors. 
Now, a depositor can withdraw her money the day after she puts it in if she wants. So it isn't a long-term uh, situation on the deposit side. So they had lent the money out for 30 years at a fixed rate, and they brought in short-term deposits. How stupid is that? Anybody in the world would tell you that's risky. And it was. And in the early 1980s, interest rates soared. And in order to keep their deposits, they had to pay like 15%. The prime rate was 21.5%. And yet they had lent the money out at 4 or 5%. So basically, uh, they failed. And my job as the director of the federal agency that was responsible for ensuring the depositor's money was to make sure that none of the depositors lost their money. So during that period, we ended up closing or emerging out of existence over 1,000 failed or failing savings and loans. And that was in a two-year period. That's how I got the name Dr. Doom. Uh, anyway, the agricultural finance crisis in the mid-80s, just a few years later, was caused by wonderful, good people doing just the opposite of what the savings and loans did. They said, we're not going to fund our loans, our long-term fixed-rate loans. We're not going to fund them overnight. We're going to go out and borrow the money for 30 years ourselves, which they did. Unfortunately, rates plummeted in the mid-60s, or mid-80s, and the farmers and ranchers, they aren't so stupid. They paid off their high interest loans and refinanced them, leaving the farm credit system with this long-term, high-cost, fixed-rate debt. When I went to uh, uh, be the CEO of the central entity of the farm credit system, we were losing <coughs> excuse me, $600 million a month. So that was a big problem. Uh, anyway, the decision makers in both these situations were hardworking, good, and intelligent people, but they didn't use clear thinking. And I'm going to give you a few tools today to help you uh, with your clear thinking. Now, in 2007, which is getting more into your generation, uh, we had another big crisis in our country. Uh, this crisis was in large part caused by home prices going up, 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 up all the time, especially in some of the hot spots. And one of those hot spots happened to be where my bank is in St. George, Utah. In fact, it was the fastest growing, I, I, they call it a metropolitan area, but it was the fastest growing area in the United States in the uh, leading up to this crisis. So when the house bubble burst, there was a sharp decline in home prices, and this caused financial pain around the world to individuals, companies, governments, as, as these home prices fell and, and the banks that had made these loans started to suffer huge losses. A couple of years before this crisis, uh, as was mentioned, I was an advisor to the Federal Reserve Board, and uh, that board, uh, Chairman Alan Greenspan was the chair, and it meets in a beautiful boardroom in a building called the Mariner S. Eccles Federal Reserve Building on Constitution Avenue in Washington, D.C. Does, any, does anybody know who Mariner S. Eccles is? Mariner S. Eccles was a Utahn. He went to high school at Brigham Young College. He served a mission in Scotland. He was a friend of mine. Although he was much older, I used to go to lunch and listen to his stories because as a young attorney, I represented uh, some of the Eccles' interests in, in Utah. He was appointed by Franklin Roosevelt in 1934 and served for 12 years as chairman of the Federal Reserve Bank during the, the Great Depression and uh, part of world, uh, actually through World War II. Anyway, they named the building after him in 1982. But uh, 
this room where we would meet in the Mariner S. Eccles building was the most ornate room in Washington. Tall, maybe 25 foot ceiling, gold all around it. And this is where Roosevelt and Churchill would meet to plan their strategies for World War II. Anyway, so I'm in this meeting, and Chairman Greenspan, this is two years before the crisis, asks, okay, what will it take for the public to lose confidence in Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac? Now, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were two huge government-sponsored uh, entities that bought mortgages from uh, banks and savings and loans and other mortgage originators. And they were immense. We're talking hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars. And the, people were starting to get concerned that they were getting too big and what would it take to lose confidence in them? So he, Greenspan asked this, his board and the, the advisors that were in the room, okay, what would it take to lose confidence in Freddie and Fannie? Dead silence for quite a while. And I sat there hoping somebody would speak up. And finally, I said, after a very uncomfortable period of silence, I said, well, perhaps if the world's investors lose confidence in the accuracy of their accounting systems. We have a distinguished professor of accounting visiting, so he can relate to this. And then I said, and maybe when the world wakes up to the fact that homes are more expensive than is justifiable by the rent rates of homes, and maybe when the world wakes up to the fact that people are having to pay a greater and greater and greater percentage of their income to support the loans they have on their homes. I just threw that out. Pres uh, President, Chairman Greenspan said softly, and I remember these words very distinctly. He said, those are sobering interjections. And that was the end of that discussion. Uh, even smart and intelligent folks, as mem like the members of the Federal Reserve Board, were not thinking clearly about the storm clouds that were brewing over the housing market. One of the major regrets in my life is that I didn't do much about this information that I had. I went back and changed the way uh, our bank uh, coped with this housing bubble. And uh, of all the banks that were headquartered in St. George in 2007, ours was the only one that survived. But I didn't go to Congress, I didn't go to my friends at Treasury, I didn't go to anybody and pound the table like I should have. And we, we, you all probably know, Freddie and Fannie both failed. Uh, and uh, the housing bubble burst. And this all led to what we call the Great Recession. And uh, if it hadn't been for massive federal bailouts, many, many banks and other financial institutions around the world would have actually failed because the bonds and the mortgage-backed securities that Freddie and Fannie issued were purchased all over the world. So, with the benefit of hindsight, it is clear that each of these crises could have been avoided or at least mitigated had we uh, not, uh, had we th thought more clearly. Now, there is another aspect of the agricultural crisis which I will mention, and uh, this was mentioned in the introduction. When I went to Farm Credit, we decided that uh, we had already foreclosed on enough farms. I don't know if you've ever been to a foreclosure sale of a farm, but it's a tragic thing. Maybe it, the farm's been in the family for generations, but. Somebody comes out and they have an auction and they sell the farm, they sell the equipment, they sell the tractors, they sell everything. And the poor farmer who's the debtor just has to sit there and watch all of this go away. When I got to farm credit, we had already foreclosed on and owned 13,000 farms and ranches. And uh, we said, you know what? 
this isn't helping the situation because every time we would buy a farm or a ranch, it would depress the values in that whole area and make it even harder uh, for the farmers and ranchers that were still on the land to be able to uh, manage their, their uh, deteriorating financial situations. There were huge demonstrations in Washington. I don't, you probably don't remember this, but uh, there were tractors and, and blockades and everything. And most of those things were uh, focused on the farm credit system. So we decided that uh, we would do everything we could to avoid foreclosure, keep the farmers and ranchers on their farms, give them additional time to pay, lower the interest rate, in some cases even lower the principal. And eventually the problem was, uh, was solved. I was riding a horse one day with a group of uh, people in the uh, rugged Santa Catalina Mountains in Arizona. And there was one uh, woman in the group that was an excellent rider, and I just happened to ask her, I said, did you grow up on a ranch? And she said, yeah. She said, I did. I grew up on a ranch in New Mexico. And then she went on to say that her family had come very close to losing her, the ranch to foreclosure to the farm credit system. And she said, my parents were just beside themselves because this was a ranch that had been in the family for generations. And then she said, and then all of a sudden, the farm credit system came and decided to work with my parents. We were able to keep the farm and they eventually paid off the loan. And I said, well, when did that happen? And she said, well, I think it was in about the mid 80s. And nothing more was said, but I felt a little of the sweetness about which President Monson had spoken. You know, the importance of clear thinking is not really that new. In the Bible, uh, in Luke 14 and 28, it says, For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first, counteth the cost, whether he has sufficient to finish it? In other words, sit down and look at the situation. I found a few keys over the years that uh, are not always easy to implement, but as President Sowell suggested, leader servants must be able to analyze complex situations from a variety of perspectives. So his counsel is right on. So my first key to clear thinking is to set aside what you want the results to be and what you hope the results will be and model the outcome. Uh, use a wide range of scenarios. Uh, with computers, uh, modeling financial decisions is relatively easy, but there are lots of decisions, of course, that aren't financial decisions, but regardless, take the decision of whether or not you're gonna use drugs. Sit down and say, now, all right, what are the, what are the various outcomes? None of the outcomes is good. <laughs> so. I can't figure out why anybody would ever start down that track if they applied any me measure of clear thinking. Uh, a second way to uh, help yourself with clear thinking is to consult others who don't have a vested interest in the outcome. Ask others to evaluate your reasoning and, and uh, I think if these savings and loan operators had gone to an eighth grade class and said, what do you think about the idea of loaning money out for 30 years and borrowing on something that's variable? I think that the class would have probably said that's not a very good idea, and it isn't. And if somebody goes to a group of people and says, I'm thinking of starting an addictive habit in drugs, what do you think about that idea? <laughs> They'd say, I probably ought to think again. Try to get hard data and be, awa be uh, aware of anecdotes. It really uh, bugs me when my kid, kid, one of my children says, uh, well, I talked to somebody and he said this and that, and uh, you can't base your decision solely on, uh, on a, an anecdote or on just somebody's opinion. Try to get hard data and be aware of anecdotes. And then don't follow the crowd just because everybody else is doing it, just because all the other savings and loans in the country are doing it, that doesn't make it right. 
Now, I'm going to stick my neck out here a little. Uh, the world also needs some clear thinking leader servants who create wealth. Keep in mind that wealth is usually created by people adding value in, to the lives of others. We all know that the love of money is called the root of all evil, and we have been taught that it is hard for a rich man to get into heaven as, as it is for a camel to get through the eye of a needle. And of course, the eye of the needle is a low door in, in a wall in biblical times. It, the the uh, camel had to take off everything it had on its back to s crawl through. But I actually think it is totally impossible for a rich man or woman to get into heaven. It's impossible. I don't think there'll be one rich man or woman in heaven. <laughs> and that is because the instant one per a person dies, all their riches are left behind. <laughs> and uh, so, seriously, anyone who pays an honest tithe and makes generous offerings and follows the admonition in the Book of Mormon to seek first the kingdom of God and then seek riches with the intent to do good, they should be able to uh, get past the pearly gates, at least on that issue. Uh, wealth is another word for stored opportunities. And with stored opportunities, you can allocate them to build the kingdom, build temples, chapels, schools, build communities, build universities like this one, bless the needy, and so forth. Uh, you all know the story of the Good Samaritan. In primary, we were taught to be Good Samaritans. But uh, I don't think the primary teacher ever urged any of us kids to follow the Good Samaritan's example to make enough money to be able to afford the oil, the wine, the beast, and still have two pence left over to pay the innkeeper. Nor did they ever say to have a credit rating that was good enough that you could go to the innkeeper and say, give him whatever he wants, and when I come back, I'll pay it. We don't talk about that side of the story, but if it hadn't been for that side of the story, he couldn't have been necessarily the good Samaritan. In the early days of SVU, there were lots of wonderful people that came together, and, and even to this day, uh, to, to build this university. And I, I'd mentioned uh, particularly Chairman Knight. He was, was a wonderful benefactor of this university. There are many others, uh, many other really wonderful people. Uh, one of those uh, would be the Marriott family. And uh, one of my roommates in graduate school was a member of the extended Marriott family. And one night when we probably should have been uh, reading our cases, uh, he just said out of the blue, he said, Brent, I figured it out. I said, what? And he said, the value of wealth is determined by how it is used to bless people. That was the definition of the value of wealth. At the end of the day, people are all that really matter. Uh, and of course, we have to remember that that's uh, God's work and glory also is, to, uh, is centered on blessing people. And so we need to think about how to deal with other people. The world needs leader servants who think clearly about how they deal with other people. I think uh, section 121 of the Doctrine and Covenants gives us some really good clues in this regard. And keep in mind that this section was written while Joseph Smith was in the Liberty Jail. And he basically uh, it says that uh, no power or influence can or ought to be maintained, but only by persuasion, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, kindness, and pure knowledge, and so forth. One of your uh, professors here, uh, Mark Matheson, if I can find your quote, Mark. I found it. Uh, I actually came across this just on the net. 
it's a blog that he uh, responded to, and he says, "Why are there not more? Why are there not more servant leaders? Because it takes great personal effort to overcome our natural selfishness and desire to dominate by controlling them. Few leaders can." E exert the humility and self-discipline and be governed by, and then he quotes the 121st section, by persuasion, by long-suffering, by gentleness, by meekness, and by love unfeigned. Well, Mark is right on in that regard. It's difficult to do it, but uh, it's something we need to do. As long as we're talking about the Liberty Jail, uh, let me suggest that clear-thinking leader servants need to be forgiving. Uh, it doesn't really make any sense not to forgive others by holding a grudge or being angry, because who does it hurt? It hurts us, and we can't be forgiven unless we forgive. So no clear-thinking person, theoretically, should be unforgiving. Now, W. W. Phelps had apostatized from the church, and he signed the affidavit which was used to incarcerate Joseph Smith into the Liberty Jail. He came back later, and he, he uh, re repented, and he wrote Joseph Smith a letter. And in that letter, he said, I am as the prodigal son. I have seen the folly of my way. I tremble the gulf I have passed. I know my situation. You know it. God knows it. And I want to be saved if my friends will help me. I have done wrong, and I am sorry. The beam is in my own eye. I ask for forgiveness. I ask for your fellowship. If you cannot grant that, grant me your peace and friendship. For we are brethren, and our communion used to be sweet. Now, Joseph Smith had suffered greatly in the Liberty Jail for, for these false accusations. But setting an example for all clear-thinking leader servants, Joseph Smith wrote back as follows, Dear Brother Phelps, I must say that it is with no ordinary feelings that I endeavor to write a few lines to you in answer to yours. It is true that we have suffered much in consequence of your behavior one with whom we had oft taken sweet counsel together and enjoyed many refreshing seasons from the Lord. Had it been an enemy, we could have borne it. Then he goes on to say, I shall be happy once again to give you the right hand of fellowship and rejoice over the returning prodigal. Come on, dear brother, since the war is past, for friends at first, our friends again at last. Yours as ever, Joseph Smith, Jr. Now, as you know, Brother, poet, Brother uh, Phelps was a poet, and today we sing many of his beautiful hymns, including The Spirit of God Like a Fire is Burning, which is sung at the dedication of every temple. So he, re uh, Brother Phelps rejoined the saints in Nauvoo, and a few years later was asked to deliver the eulogy at a memorial service for Joseph Smith. He recited a poem that he had written. What, are, what was the poem? If you know the poem that was recited at that eulogy, raise your hand. Good. For the rest of you, the poem begins Praise to the man who communed with Jehovah. Now, when we, we had the opportunity today to come in and hear the beautiful choir that you have in this university, and that's what they were singing when we came in. So that's why we need to be forgiving. Now, I'm going to... Uh, uh, ask a couple more questions. How do you, how do you uh, make decisions to think clearly? 
It takes courage. President Kimball said the, the greatest word in the English language was to remember. Uh, maybe the second greatest wor word in the English language is courage. Courage to choose the right. And they gave me the opportunity to pick the song today, and I chose that one, Choose the Right. If we stop and think clearly, we will almost know what the right choice is. But we don't always choose the right. Uh, so when, and in fact, when it comes to keeping the commandments, it's almost impossible not to know what the right choice is because we, uh, we have the light of Christ within us and we've also been baptized, and most of us, and have the gift of the Holy Ghost. So we all have the ability to think clearly on moral issues, and the answers are usually pretty obvious. So why do we who want to be faithful leader servants sometimes make bad choices that seemingly no clear thinker would make? You know, it has been said that the flesh is willing, or I mean the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. But isn't it just saying that we lack courage to make the right choice. Uh, C.S. Lewis said, courage is not simply one of the virtues, but the form of every virtue at the testing point. There's a decisive point where you make a decision. You're either going to be courageous and choose the right or you're not. And the late uh, Maya Angelou uh, made the same point. She said, courage is the most important of all virtues because without courage, you can't practice any other virtue consistently. Okay, so how do we get the courage needed to choose the right after we have determined through our clear thinking what the right choice is? Some years ago, the U.S. military wanted to figure out why some soldiers would freeze up or f and flee in the face of a battle and others would stay and fight, have the courage to stand up and fight. I mean, that's a big deal if you're in the military is to see if you can figure out uh, which ones are going to do what. So they interviewed hundreds of men, some who stood and fought and some who, uh, who cowered and fled. And they asked them questions like, what was the relationship with their fathers? What, what, did they have a wife and kids? Were they rich or poor? Did they, were they religious or not religious? Were they educated or not educated? Did they play sports? None of these background factors seemed to correlate whether or not a soldier would stand and fight, except for one. They found that those who thought clearly, clearly about their goals in life and wrote them down would stand and fight. Now, why would that be? If you're a soldier, what is your main goal? To get home alive. <laughs> How are you going to get home alive? You're going to win the war. How are you going to win the war? You're going to stand up and fight. That's the only solution. So I would urge you as leader servants to write down your goals, think clearly about them, think about how you're gonna reach them. Fortunately, I had the opportunity as a young missionary in Argentina, and I'm gonna deviate here for just a minute. I was thrilled to meet uh, Jessica Brotherson last night who just got back from Argentina. She, uh, I asked her uh, what mission she went to, and she told me, and of course I had never heard of it, because when I was there, there was one mission, and now there's 12. When I was there, there was not a single stake in all of South America. Anybody want to guess how many there are now? Hundreds, hundreds and hundreds. I'm, I, I have it written down here somewhere, but I won't take the time to look for it. It's like 500. There's 12 missions in Argentina and 90 missions in South America. There's over 4 million members of the church in South America today, but there wasn't a single stake in all of South America. That's how old I am. Uh, anyway, uh, while, I, while I was in Argentina on my mission, 
My senior companion had a meeting. He said, you sit on the porch. It was my 20th birthday. I sat on this porch and sweltered and wrote down 10 goals that have stayed with me all my life. The first one was to remain a faithful member of the church and to serve as best I could. And then it went on from there. So write down your goals, look at them often, have the courage to keep them. In closing, I just want to urge you again to remember the words of President Monson. The world is in need of your help. The world is in need of clear thinking leader servants who will remember their goals and who have the courage to make correct choices. May your clear thinking, excuse me, your most clear thinking will come through the power of prayer and through the discernment and inspiration whispered to your soul by the Holy Ghost. And as you choose wisely, your courage and confidence will grow. May you find deep satisfaction and sweet experiences in your studies at this wonderful university and then on through your life's journey. And may you have peace and joy in your heart when you give that final accounting to your master. And I say this in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.